Well, hey, everybody, thanks for coming back to the CEO for Life Experience. This is our podcast where we like to talk about what it's like to be not only the CEO of your life, but what it's like to be CEO of a business. And we like to bring you great guests that are CEOs, maybe long tenured, very mature, maybe new, but they have that CEO in them and that DNA. And we like to share their experiences, their ideas, their hacks, and just get some strategy and invest in people. And today I'm really excited because I got Kale Owen from Gym Launch with me today. And, uh, and Kale's not only got a tremendous background, with um with professional as a professional athlete but he's grown up in business and probably one of the most difficult industries in fun and fitness which is super competitive so i'm sure we're going to talk about that but then he's also right now he's now the ceo of prestige labs and ceo of gym launch and uh kale thanks for being with us man thanks for having me on i'm very excited and honored to be on here it's funny when you said you talked about the spectrum of ceos i definitely fall on the spectrum of more immature and just getting into it so obviously uh i I'm excited to have this conversation for sure. Super cool. Well, great. Well, listen, uh, maybe we can just start with the, the 30 minute, uh, 30 second elevator, or just with some of your background and we can dive into some good content. Yeah, for sure. Random facts about me. I was homeschooled my entire life up until college, never went a day to class, never went to a single class up until freshman year in college. Loved being homeschooled. Baseball was my life from the age of 18 to 23. Uh, when I turned, my entire goal was to play professional baseball. I was able to accomplish that, not to the level that I wanted to. I wanted to be Shortstop the New York Yankees. That did not happen. Uh, got a little cup of coffee in the Philadelphia Phillies organization. And then after that, I transitioned into business. And I knew that I wanted to do something in business. Um, and when I got out of baseball, I was fascinated by fitness. So ended up actually being a partner in a facility outside of Tampa and West Chase. Went from there to starting another facility in St. Augustine, Florida. And from there, that's how I learned about Gym Launch. Became a client of Gym Launch first in 2017 joined their team as an intro sales guy. So literally on the ground floor, just selling for them in 2018, moved to sales manager from there, was then able to move to coaching manager, got to see both sides of the business as we were growing and going through different areas, became GM of Gym Launch in January of 2020. So right before everything hit the wall um, and then was GM through 2020 and to the end of 2021 and then transitioned into CEO after we got acquired uh, majority um, ownership was acquired by American Pacific Group, a private equity firm out of California, um, literally Christmas Eve of 2021, and then was uh, became CEO. And now just working through that, working to try to ultimately help gym owners reach more people, change more lives and stack more cash. So, okay, so this is great because we'll just start here. Um, it was never an intentional path to be CEO, right? And no. that, was, that was never radar, right? From homeschool, I mean, you know, through through the coaching, I mean, you started out as a client with Gym Launch. So, so talk a little bit about that. Talk about, maybe share with us the signs that began to open to you where you began to see, okay, well, maybe this is the path I'm going. How did that, just walk us through how did the signs begin to show themselves that maybe some people should be looking for as they're moving down the path? Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, I think baseball helped me with this a ton. So in baseball, being who I was, I was always the smallest kid. I was always the one that I would say that had the least amount of um, genetic ability and talent, God-given talent. And so I had to work my butt off consistently. And I fell in love with the hard work, realizing that I was okay with delayed gratification. Mm. And I was willing to put in the hours on hours on hours of work, knowing that it would pay off in the end because I would do so much work that it would be unreasonable for me to not be successful at some point. And so doing that kind of led into the business side. But what I found was as at a young age, and maybe homeschooling was a part of this, maybe moving around a lot when I was younger, maybe baseball, maybe just a lot of just who I am um, with my personality is I love the pursuit of new skills. Mm. And so when I came into gym launch or any business or doing anything, I really look forward to learning every single day. I was just shooting content this morning with my videographer and we were just doing random questions, right? About me, just kind of get to know me a little bit more that we'll post. And one of the questions was essentially like, what do I love most about my job? And my, the thing I love most about my job is I get to learn something new every single day. Mm -hmm. I get to be on with you today, right? And I get to have a conversation that I've never had before. And maybe this will lead to something new that I get to learn from you, Robert, that I've never learned before. And my goal was never to be CEO. It was never a title. I don't care about titles. I care much more about, for me, selfishly, the opportunity to learn and acquire new skills that will allow me to be able to change or impact the world in a different way, in a more profound way. 
so it leads me so you, you made a comment you know we talked about being hungry we talked about the work ethic we talked about the long view right talk about you know not necessarily chasing the title um but really the growth yeah you know it's something that i think that's interesting and, and i run into quite a lot when i'm working with clients or teams or leaders when do you know when to pivot in these moments right so maybe okay i, I i've decided that i'm going this long route and i'm going to put in the work ethic but what, what are the signs we heard a little bit from you on the signs that were working and what was working towards you. When do you know when to pivot? So like maybe like from baseball, you made a huge pivot, right? I mean, you had to make a decision. I This was my life. I've invested in this. This is what I want to do. But you had to make a decision to do something different. Talk a little bit about that. What 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 are kind of some of the things you, you, you go through to learn that or do that? Give me one second. My dog is about to bark. <laughs> it's I apologize. All, it's all great. My dog is right here and I've got a, a FedEx truck or like an Amazon truck that's about to walk over, but I'll start talking yeah, yeah. and then if we need to get into it, we can. Yeah, uh, no, it's good. So let's take baseball, for example. Yeah. When you're a business owner or a CEO or you're looking to grow and do anything, the pivot happens when the data tells you that you need to pivot. Okay. And so let's take baseball, for example. When I pivoted and stopped baseball, and so for context, I played a season, got a ring at the rookie league ball, got up to high A for literally one game. So when I say cup of coffee, I had a cup of coffee. I sh frankly, genetic ability should never have even played pro ball, but got the opportunity, worked my butt off, had incredible people that helped me along the way. Get there, didn't play a ton, didn't hit really well. My claim to fame is I hit 333 because I went one for three in my one game in high A. So right. I, with a Clearwater Threshers actually, so that was fun. I got to play hometown, which is awesome. But come back spring training. <laughs> I get invited back and sorry about that. My dog. It's all good, man. Let me go meet this person real quick. Do we have a second? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. There we go. So for context, I come back and I come back to spring training. I get invited and I make it through and there's three cuts in spring training. And what happens is you walk up to the clubhouse and there's a guy sitting out there on cut days and he just grabs you and pulls you in. I go by day one, no one wants to look at him. So you walk into the clubhouse, no one wants to make eye contact. Everyone's just like, yeah, you're, you're not there. Walk by, cool, oh, okay, make it through. Next cut day that happens. I'm like, oh no, okay, don't, don't call me. Walk by, last day of spring training before they send everyone off to their teams, everything else. I'm walking up, not making eye contact. I give him one quick look and he's like, let's go. And I was like, okay. They pull me in. I knew I was getting released. What was interesting is when I went in, I had this, I was totally calm and I totally, I understood. I was not completely dejected because I understood I'd given everything that I knew that I could. Mm -hmm. And I go into this meeting. They're telling me, they're like, we would love to have you long-term look at potentially becoming a coach. Um, Cause I knew the game really well, but that's also a, like, when you hear that, you're also like, yeah, you suck at baseball. So you should think about coaching. But the other thing that they, right. So you're just like hearing that in the back of your head. You're like, cool. So I definitely suck at baseball. Oh, this is great. Um, those who can't do teach. Right. We're not so you're good like, enough to date, but we can yeah. be friends. Right? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Oh, it's not you. It's me. Like all that stuff. Yeah. So you hear that and you're like, great, cool. Appreciate that. And they also said something there. Like it would mean a lot to us if you tried to go and play more. And, um, and I sat there and I remember vividly thinking I'm 23 years old. I played baseball with, I'll give an example, Mikel Franco. Mikel Franco at the time was 17 years old. He was, I don't know what he is now. I don't know how tall he is, 6'2". He was 220 pounds, played third base, threw 95 across the infield with a flick of his wrist and hit 450, 480 foot shots at 17 years old. And I'm over here, 23 years old, 5'9", 150 pounds at the end of the season. Hmm. Can't, I'm not a fast runner. I run like a 6'9", 60. I don't have an arm. I can't hit for power. And I'm thinking the data doesn't back it up mm. because I know the business, right? I know the game of, of baseball. Yeah. I know the business, like potential is everything and age is everything. And I've already way past. If I was 17 years old, cool. I'm going to try to keep playing and see what I can do. I'm 23 years old at my skill set level, just looking in the mirror, I was past my prime already. And so I was like, cool. Do I want to have the life where I just continue to try to grind it out? and spin my wheels and not gain any new skills? Mm -hmm. Or is it my time to now move on and try something new and live a different life than I have for the last 12, 13 years, right? And so, well, 15 at that point, cause eight years old. So then I was like, cool, it doesn't make sense, I'm done. It was a Friday, I got released. I called the company that I was working with 
over the off season, called them. They were like, yeah, come on, we'll take you full time. Monday, I was working full time with this business mm -hmm. and learning a new skill set, learning how to understand behavior, learning how to read behavior, flex behavior, sell all those things. So I was learning all those things and I never looked back like ever. And kind of thinking about that when you're, when we think about pivoting, we look at all as much data as we possibly can. We look at the numbers, we look at the macroeconomic situations. We look at the numbers internally. We look at what our clients are saying. We look at what our employees are saying. We take all these things. And if something isn't working, right, the first thing that we do before we think of making a change is we first look at, are we executing at the level and carrying out the plan that we had originally put out? Right. And if we aren't, then let's just do it better. Then let's do more of what we're doing better. And then let's try something new. Because I spend a bunch of my time thinking strategically, which is the direction we should go. And I take all this input. I take all this data. I talk to people that are way smarter than me all the time. I get their input on which direction. And once we have that set and that strategic vision set with this incredible board that we have and all these incredibly smart people that we have, once that's set, then it comes down to execution most of the time. Mm -hmm. And so one of the weakness, and I apologize if I'm long-winded on this, but I think your question in regards to pivoting, I think people pivot too fast, in my opinion, and they simply should just dig back in to the actual execution of the work. Are they actually doing it at the volume right. and the level that they need to? And most people aren't. Yeah, that's a super good point. I'm glad you made that distinction because, you know, we, we worked through, you know, walking this through is, you know, yeah, you've got to, you got to start, you got to be able to collect data. You then got to go back and reference the data, right? But then you got to look at, okay, well, what are the outcomes? Because then you got to lever, you got to lean on execution. Am I executing at the volume enough that the data is good enough to make the decision in order to make the pivot, right? So all those pieces are together. And the distinction I was, I wanted to make with this is that's the same in life as it is right in our business. Those are the same things, relationships, what you're doing in terms of anything that you want in terms of your growth in your personal life, or whether it's in your spiritual life or your finances, or whether it's, you know, being the CEO, you know, you've got to start, you've got to collect data. You then got to know that you're doing enough that the data really matters. You got to make sure your execution is there and then go back and evaluate. These are all the same things, right? Oh yeah. Without yeah. a doubt. The same things cross over into my, how I treat my family, how right. my relationship is with my wife. Right. And it's all the same stuff completely. Yeah. I love it. I love, I love it. I love the mindset. All right. So let's dive a little bit into uh, what do you think a CEO is? So let's, let's really jump into professional and the business side of things. So, you know, um, you've been given this opportunity. There's been some changes with gym launch and the sale. You got these new, you know, you got this, you got this firm that now oversees and you still have some, you saw some owners that are in play. You have all of these, all of these things that are moving and yeah. now you have this title and this responsibility, right? Yeah. I know you're not in a vacuum. I know you're not alone, but yeah. still there is, it's, it's you now. And mm -hmm. so you've got to make some decisions, cast vision, make movement, make some decisions. So tell me a little bit about what do you walk into the role saying, okay, well, this is this, the role of the CEO. I want to get Kale's definition. Love it. I'm going to steal from people that are smarter than me because I really I love, love it. this. Um, yeah. Patrick Lencioni calls it in one of his books. I believe it's the motive. Um, if I name that right, because I love all of his books and I think it's this one, he talks about, he tells a story and he talks about how a CEO is actually a CRO, okay. a chief reminding officer. And I view my position as the chief reminding officer for all the brands that we have, uh, whether it's the two that we have more as we continue to build and acquire is my job to go in, support the team to the best of my ability and continue to remind everyone on a daily basis, what our vision is what our mission is and what we're trying to accomplish and how we accomplish those. And then beyond that is not just reminding them verbally, but also living it out and showing them by more importantly, how I show up to calls, how I show up to meetings, how I prepare for things, how I communicate with them and what my expectations are for them. And that's kind of, that's the first step of it. Um, and it's pretty broad, but I, I think for, if you're a CEO, that really helped me single down because I can tell you this, when I became CEO, I didn't think it was going to like, I would feel the impact of it because I had already basically been running the company in right. a sense for the last year, if not a little bit more, but Which like is most cases, most cases when you, you move into that role, right? Yeah. You, you've been, you've been executing some. Sure. Correct. But you still have, you know, if you think about it, I was GM. So you still kind of have that like parachute in a sense where it's kind of like, you have that little, that brake pad with Alex and Layla and the executive team <laughs> through that. And even though like my wife and I were running the business, like at the same time, you still have that, like 
that brake pad available for you. Yeah. And, um, but when it happened, I remember for probably two or three days um, between Christmas and New Year's, and I'm never like this. Um, I remember laying in bed for about three straight nights and not being able to sleep for about three hours. Mm. And I just, I was sitting there thinking and I realized, I started processing the feelings that I was getting and the feelings I were getting were doubt and fear um, and this inadequacy, mm. right? And then I realized, I recognized after day two and it still happened the day after, but I recognized day two and I realized number one, these, these thoughts and feelings don't serve me. Mm. Number two, they're not true. And number three is every single person has thought these before at some level or not. Yeah. And they continue to think them. And so after day three, I was just like, cool, we're done. It's time to do work. Mm -hmm. And from then on, it's it's been much more about obviously showing up for the team and being prepared and ready to go um, at all times. Because the part of that of showing up for your team consistently and being that chief reminding officer in a gracious way, right? It allows you to help grow more leaders through your actions and the way that you show up. Because I, do, I never want to abdicate my responsibility as a leader. And that could come down to needing to fire someone. Right. That could need to um, either demoting someone or changing plans, right. pivoting. Yep. If it's my decision that we need to, and I know we need to do it and we need to pivot and we need to make a change in a department or as a business as a whole, that is my decision and I have to make it. And once we make it, we go. I can't abdicate my responsibility to the team and be like, yeah, well, cool. I know we need to go this way, but what do you guys think? What do you think we should do? Do you think we should go somewhere else? Once I've gathered all the data and all the input and everything, it's like, no, the decision has been made and we need to go. And alongside that, so CRO is kind of the main thing. The second piece is just innovation. Yeah. Is really being the person that's living a year, two years, three years in advance, looking at what is the data telling us? What is the marketplace telling us? What's a macroeconomic situation looking like? Looking at the financial markets, looking at where we're at, because it all is interwoven now in this world that we live in. And especially as we try to build and ultimately build a portfolio of various different companies. And we're on the verge of having literally three different types of companies in our portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we prepare for that? How do we innovate? And learning the intricacies of each business. A product business is very different than a service business. Um, a SaaS business is very different than a product or a service business. And there's similarities between them, but they all have their own intricacies, metrics, and ways to become successful and grow. So those are kind of the two areas is chief reminding officer, and then ultimately the leader of innovation. So a couple of things that came out of this discussion, if we can maybe unpack, and I think this will probably push us to our time. So allow me a little bit of kale, allow, allow me this. The first thing you 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 mentioned was thought life. And, and I think this is an critical piece that, that I'd really love to unpack with you because not only do you have an athlete's mind, but you have the coaching side and you have the fitness side and, and now the leading and the equity and the business side. You know, uh, something I teach a lot of leaders and I, and I walk them through, especially in these moments of beginning a relationship together and helping them reach, reach your potential is, you know, we're speaking to ourselves 4,000 words a minute, psychologists and studies show that takes an hour to speak that verbally, right? So that's super powerful in the, in the, in the thought, the thought life. So walk me through, like, how did you, is it like working out your muscle as the brain in terms of getting control? Cause you said it, you gave yourself a deadline. You had three days and you said, I'm done. This is, these are not serving me. And I've made a movement and I'm moving past it. So walk us through just some help and some hacks with thought life. Yeah. The first the first thing that I started doing, and I'm shout out to, again, the people that are smarter than me that I learned from. So I have Same. so many mentors and incredible, Same. like Alex and Layla have both getting to sit next to them and work with them for four years was, has been to this day, the greatest experience in my life. Um, I count them as friends and obviously they're still continue to be mentors. Um, and I hope for the rest of my life that that is the case. And I'm very grateful for that because I've learned so many things. One of the most important lessons was that there's no reason, no need for me to beat myself up over negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. the, the point of it though, is for me to recognize when a negative thought comes in and realize that, okay, cool. It's, it could be a negative thought. If you think about it in some ways could be very positive because if you're in a place of danger, a perceived negative thought of like, you need to get out, run, this is bad. That's actually a positive thought. So it depends yes. on the situation. Yes. Right. Right. So a positive thought in a negative right. situation might be bad. It's like, no, you're good. You're safe. You got a gun <laughs> pointed to your head. It's like, cool. Tell yeah. them to pull the trigger, be positive. And it's like, that's not a good situation. So for me, it's realizing, cool. Why am I? Okay, cool. First, let me recognize it. Why am I doing this? The next question I always ask myself and a lot of people that I work with and team is like, 
does this serve you? Mm -hmm. And not only does it serve you now, but does this serve future self? Mm -hmm. So if you continue with these thoughts and patterns that lead into actions and the words that you say verbally, both internally and verbally, externally, is that going to help you, your 10 year old later self? Right. So I'm 34. So if I start an action and I start thinking these thoughts and I start leading down this path of behaviors, are those behaviors going to serve me and the people around me and, and help me reach my goal by the time I'm 44? Mm -hmm. And is it going to be something that's going to help me along that path? And when I'm 44, I'm going to look back and be like, that was something that served me and the people around me and allowed us to create a bigger impact. Or is it going to be something that's only going to hold me back, create more fear and lead me to destructive behaviors? I love, I love the, does it serve me label? I haven't quite ever heard it that way mm -hmm. um, or explained it that way, but I love that capture the thought and put the label on it. Does it serve me and put it in the right bucket? I love yeah. that. That's a great way to look at it. That's awesome. It's, uh, can I say one thing about faith real quick? Cause in the Bible, it talks about do not fear all the yeah. time. Right. right. And except God, right. We should have a very healthy fear of God, yeah. right. In the way of respect and For fear sure. of understanding yeah. that he created everyone. So well, the way I think about it too, is there's, there's for me, because of my faith, there is freedom in this where I do not have to fear anything. Right. There's no reason to fear anything. Right. So while there are people listening to this that don't have the same faith as I do, totally cool. Yeah. Just have that same thought process. Does yeah. this serve me? And for some conservative Christians, they're like, that's a selfish thing to say. Does it serve me? Instead, does it serve God? Yeah. You could twist it that way. I just find it helps me a lot when I say, does it serve me? Yeah. So, yeah, that's a super, yeah, and that thought helps me too, is because, you know, I've dealt with anxiety throughout my life in a few moments, and it's just really, you know, been tough, tough moments, but I've grown through that. And mm -hmm. like, for me, what I've had to learn, especially in, in those moments, or does my thoughts serve me is, it's almost egotistical to think I have that much control, right? You, you know, so yeah. I can think about it as long as I want, but I really don't have that much control. So I just need to move. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and so I, I love, yeah, and you know, and that comes down to faith, you just, yep. you just got to move, right? Yeah. That's it. For sure. All right. So the next point I wrote down, what I love is just making a decision. And I know we talked a little bit about this in that deadline, which I love, but then let's jump into actions. So you talked about being an influence for your team, for your customers and everything else. So living out the, what your expectations are, right? So what are, what's the foundation from that for you? Where do you, where do you come from that? And how do you know whether you are living out those actions? Um, because if you do have some of the imposter going on and some of those things that are shaking on yourself, how do you, how do you put yourself in a check to make sure you're living out the actions? My wife does a phenomenal job. <laughs> Don't they all? I know. It does a phenomenal job of that. Um, I really gut check. I check myself with my team a yeah. lot, obviously with my wife first. And I'm, I have this incredible opportunity of working at a high level with my wife. She's, she and I are one or one and two at the top um, yep. within the two businesses. And yep. we also both work from home and yep. she's incredibly wise um, mm -hmm. and extremely logical and literally the perfect counterpart to myself. Mm -hmm. And our communication level is exceptional. We're very transparent with each other and she keeps me in check and she will absolutely gut check me at any point. Mm -hmm. And I, I seek out her, I look for her feedback more than anyone else. And I listen to her more than anything else. And um, because I'm looking for that feedback because she knows me better than anyone else. Right. And I look for that, but I also, I'm talking about the feedback piece. I also seek it from my team mm -hmm. as well. Um, or our team. I can't say my team. It's our team. It's a, it's a full team. Yeah. I seek it from them. Um, I want to know, cool. How can I support you more? Is there anywhere that I'm not supporting? Is there anywhere where you feel like you have questions about what you should be doing or your unclear expectations? Yep. And I honestly should do it more um, than what I am. And the goal is always to really, I want to make sure that they are fully supported and have what they have. Kind of going back to the original piece, I guess, is what are the things that are the core foundational pieces of being able to show up for your team? And what I kind of value in those ways is I think the number one piece for our team, and we have core tenants that we, we live and work by, right. but one of the biggest things is have humility. Mm -hmm. And when you show up and you have humility and you act with curiosity out of curiosity, and you seek to understand rather than be understood, right. then you're in a position where you can learn and you're now open and receptive to different ways of thinking and different ways of doing things. And you now have the ability to influence people. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I've had to work on a really long time and I'm, it's still in progress, um, by no means perfect and a long ways from it. But one of the biggest things I try to do is be the last person to speak in meetings because I should let the rest of the team do that. I should allow them to open up, talk. I want their feedback. I want to hear. And then my job is to ask questions for us to be able to root out what is the direction we need to go. 
Yeah, so you know, it, is just have humility, especially as leaders. For sure. You know, there's a couple of things there. You talked about influence, right? And so as you talked about the chief reminder officer, you know, your influence can come in three ways, right? There's three influence models, right? There is, you can, you can help a person attain a way to think, right? And so that is through empathy, allowing a person to question and have conversation. And that, that way you alter thinking and you become influenced that way. And then there's the challenge where you challenge someone's way to think or, or challenge them, how much better would it be if you did something differently? And then of course, the action, just living out the action. And, you know, you specifically talked about, um, you know, the piece of just reminding people, you can beat people over the head as much as you want, but that's not influence, right? And that's not your role as the CEO. It's not it. And that's not the reminding piece either. Right. <laughs> it's, it's definitely more the actions and the influence. Right. Right. Being able to challenge their beliefs, ask the right questions, and be able to get to the root cause of maybe what the problem is or how we can find the solution. Yeah. That's it. You know, just as a leader, especially as newer leaders, what I run into, and I'm sure you do too, is, you know, you just want to give out mandates, but that's not how you influence. That's not how you lead. And that's not, I'm sure that's not how you do it. And that's the way you're teaching us right now. You're coaching us through that. So I love it. It's so a let's battle. Talk about this. It's There's a battle. A, it's, what was that? It's a battle. Trust me. Yeah, it is a battle. I know because you're like, man, we got to go. Let's go. Let's go. Right. Yeah. I know. Oh yeah. Um, that is a battle push and pull. So that lead, yeah, this is a good conversation. So let's talk about this right now because, um, you have a lot of remote teams. I'm sure you have people and in, uh, influence all over the place. There's different stakeholders. There's a lot of technology probably in what you do. Um, let's talk about productivity because people are talking about quiet quitting. They're talking about quiet firing. They're talking about productivity being less and remote work and those kind of things. As an influence, how are you going around influencing your teams to make sure that, you know, that productivity is where it is? So I, I could probably, anyway, I want to hear from you. Yeah. So um, I actually did a presentation to our entire company um, a couple months back earlier this year. I think it was actually Q1. So it's more than a couple months defining who we need to become as a company mm -hmm. in each individual level and then a roadmap as to how they can get there. And I broke it down into uh, Steven Schwartzberg, I think Schwartzberg, uh, Schwartzman, Schwartzman. Um, talks about how they hire nines and tens in his yes. firm, uh, yep. which is, I think it's Blackstone yep. um, is his. And it's one of the largest private equity firms or um, unique firms in the in the world. Anyways, I'm butchering that intro for him. He's an incredible oh, guy, it's, super yeah, rich, wealthy. Yeah, yeah, Anyways. I'm with you. Yeah, Blackstone, them. BlackRock, everyone gets Yeah, Blackstone, BlackRock. Right, right, yeah, I'm with you. Larry Finch, yeah. it's all the same. Like they all broke off and started together yeah. and broke off. Anyways, right. Anyways right. Um, he talked about how he hires nines and tens. And I went to our team and I said, you know, this is who we look for and this is who we are. Now, how we act is in accordance with our core values. And I think if you're a CEO or you're someone that's looking to change the culture and attract high performers, then you need to create a space and an environment and a culture that lives and breathes high performance mm -hmm. in a way so much that if you get someone that seek that slips through the interview process that isn't a high performer they immediately know the first day they show up and they leave mm -hmm. or they step up and so the expectations have to be set to the point where every day we're showing up how can we improve how can i be a nine or a ten right. in my space and the way we defined it was most of the world is sitting in this one to seven range Sevens are okay. They come in, they clock in, they do the work. Anything less than a seven is what we're seeing now with quiet quitting, not even showing up, not even wanting to work. Eights do their job well, but they don't go above and beyond anything else. These are really great employees, but they don't step forward. They can't see the future. They can't, they're not engaged in trying to make any strategic decisions. They don't lead people very well, but they're great employees, right? And I asked my team, I was like, who here wants to be an eight? No one. Not a single person wanted to be an eight. Right. And so I said, great. But before you say that you're sure you don't want to be an eight, let's talk about what a nine and a 10 is. Because a nine is someone that goes out and they're able to lead people exceptionally well. They're able to find problems and solve the solutions, right? And be able to do it with autonomy. Mm -hmm. And so they can see it, go out and do it. Right. And so they can see the problem, they understand the solution, and then they can lead people or themselves to be able to actually successfully accomplish whatever they're trying to do. These are leaders, right? And everyone wants to think that they're a leader, but not everyone will be. But the, how it, in order to be that, you have to put in the time and the effort and then have the self awareness to understand where your weaknesses are, where your strengths are, and learn to acquire new skill sets consistently so that you can become a nine. Eights can become a nine, right? right. But the difference between a 10 and a nine is a 10 is a rainmaker in everything that they do. 
So a perfect example of the 10 maker is Alex Ramosi and Layla Hormozzi. Like Alex Ramosi is a 10. The dude has started multiple eight figure companies. Right. They run a portfolio where they're doing over $200 million a year across all their companies in total revenue, like crushing it. An example in like life, if you watch the show Yellowstone, a 10 would be John Dutton, right? Right. A nine would be Rip, right? Sure. He can think sure. through solutions, think through sure. problems, all yeah. that stuff, right? Yeah. But like John's the rainmaker. Rip right. is really good. He's a leader. People listen to him and he goes out and he gets stuff done. And, but those are nines and tens. Yep. And when you think about that, tens, in my opinion, are very hard to create. Yeah. I think tens are, are there. They have this innate ability. It's a Kobe Bryant. They just have the total package. They have the work, they have the genetic ability. They have the intelligence. They have the work ethic that they will do the absolute sheer volume but our team needs to be full of nines and tens. And when you start to breathe that every single day, yeah. and then you, you set those expectations and then you live out the core tenants on a daily basis and you recognize them every week, you recognize employees for living out those core tenants, for showing those. And then you have that expectation. All of a sudden the entire team steps up because no one wants to work. No high performers want to work with mediocre teammates. Right. And so it immediately sets the culture so that when new people come on, they level up or they get out. Yeah, right. I love that. I love, you know, the culture is, should, the culture should reflect immediately when someone's not a fit, right? I mean, that yes. this is not a part of the tribe, and it's not to say that person can't be a nine or ten on another team, right? Correct. Depending on what that culture is like. Mm -hmm. But you hit on a point that I really like to dive into, and I think this is something because, um, so I have a daughter who's seventeen, right? Awesome. And uh, she's going to be 18. And this just came up and just thinking our, through our conversation. So she has a, a couple of friends that are a year ahead of her. They're in college. They're now talking about quitting school because they want to go start businesses, right? This hustle culture, this hustle thing that they're going to go do, right? Because they feel like they need to go do this right now, right? So walk me through a little bit of, you know, when you talk about nines and tens, and I say this all the time, is like, it's okay to be number 25 at Google. It's still pretty good, right? There's nothing wrong with that in understanding that. You know, and you talked about the difference between Alex, you know, the nine and 10 things. Some people can't be made that but give me your, I mean, if I'm a nine, and I'm always pushing and it's not working. Is it okay to be the nine? And and that's where my role is. And I should be settled and it's, and it's good. Talk me through some of that. How do you, how do you coach through that? Yeah. You have to define what your ultimate goals are anyway, personally, if you truly want to be a 10, right. we can have that conversation of like, this is what's missing between where you are and where you want to go. Right. And you have to acquire these skill sets. Now, some people, I'm very much a firm believer that you can acquire a ton of skill sets, but there's typically things that are innate that come naturally to certain people that set them apart yeah. from Elon Musk is a perfect example. Right. right? So like, right. he's just a genius. The guy can do a lot of different things. Right. Right. But for most people, it's really truly understanding ultimately, what are you trying to achieve in your life? Yeah. And right. Is work everything. Yeah. The is, willingness, what are you willing to sacrifice? And are you chasing the title? Mm. Are you chasing the position or are you chasing the work? Right. Because the work is what makes you. And the right. work is the reward. Right. It's both the sacrifice and the reward because yep. you, you become the person that you will become ultimately. And the person that when you look in the mirror has respect for that person back and forth yep. by doing the work rather than the title. The title does not bestow the self-respect. It's the everyday discipline of showing up and putting in the work that gives people the self-respect that they need that no title will ever bestow on them and give them. I love it. That's love more it. important than anything else. I love it. The reward and the sacrifice are the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that, that could be an easy way to say that's the difference between the nine and the 10. I love that. Yeah. yeah. For sure. All right. I know we're running through time and I appreciate it. I want to be respectful, but I do need to talk about innovation because you've mentioned yeah. it a few times. And I think that's a super critical part of being a CEO, right? Is mm -hmm. being an innovator and being able to look further than most people. So walk me through your thoughts on innovation and how you attack it and what that looks like and, and just kind of share your thoughts on that. Yeah. So when we think of innovation specifically, and this is for, I'll try to keep this as uh, high level as possible for any sure. business owners or yeah. uh, potential business owners listening to this. The way that we think of innovation is specifically around our clients and how we can help them become more profitable through our services. And so when we're looking at their business, in order to innovate, we have to know their business better than they know it. Mm -hmm. So we have to foresee problems down the road where if we fix one problem, it will create a bottleneck down the road that we will then already have a solution for, which will then create another bottleneck, bam, bring it back, got another bottleneck. And we continually have to be solving for these and innovating for these both within their business, as well as looking out 
what solutions are outside in the world that are not being used today that we could bring from other industries into this to solve these problems more efficiently. And so we talked a little bit about this before hopping on the podcast and recording. I believe personally, especially within this niche of coaching and service in the coaching industry, especially fitness, I see this a lot. And I think this is the edge that here at Gym Launch we have fortunately above a lot of companies and I see is a downfall of a lot of companies is they do not have a dedicated research and development team. And the reason for that is because frankly, most companies don't have the margins available to actually have a dedicated team. To give you an example, I sat on an R and, our R&D meeting yesterday and we have six initiatives running right now, six different initiatives running with multiple tests and multiple betas. Mm -hmm. That's not counting a whole other business that we're starting. Right. And so when you're looking at that and it's like, this is how we are able to provide such an incredible service and foresee problems down the road for our clients and fix them before they even realize it. Or maybe we're too slow, but we now have the resources to listen to our clients when they say they have a problem, go out there and spend our money rather than our client's money right. and fix the problem through innovating, testing and betas. And so for us, we're always, always like R&D is the core part of our business that we spend a lot of our time and we have full teams just dedicated to going in, finding new offers, finding new price points, finding new ways to sell, finding new ways to keep their clients longer, new technologies that are available to enhance the client experience or the gym owner's experience, make it easier for them to read their data, go out and make more sales, get more leads, whatever it might be. Right. Everything is centered around that. And we drive that forward. And it's a big piece of what we look at as a business. And it's what I look at a lot and try to get from our clients when I'm on calls or I'm listening to them or I'm in person with them and I'm listening to their problems. Like what are the problems that you're facing right now that we haven't been able to solve yet, right? Half, to be frank, 80% of the time we've already solved it. They just haven't gone through that <laughs> section of the portal or coaching yet, but right. there's still a lot of stuff that, you know, right. cool, this would be a good idea. For sure. Yeah, you know, that's, you know, I love that because you're able to see across a lot of clients, right? Yes. And so you're able to see trends and moments and movements and you see opportunities. And we did that in our real estate firm, right? We had 225, 1099s that on their own, they're out running their own business, right? And they can see what's in front of them, but we were able to see across. And so we could bring a lot of best practice, a lot of things that were going to be beforehand. We could bring performance and efficiency across everybody. And so, you know, that's a real benefit. And, you know, I love the fact that you have this kind of incubator with inside your organization, right? That's constantly cracking at how can we be better? How can we serve? How can we solve problems before we, before anyone really even knows it's a problem. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Because then, then your clients truly trust you for sure. You can solve a problem that they never knew they had. The trust goes through the roof. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that thought around innovation. Um, Man, I think that's probably a great place to wrap up. I think it's just a awesome. nice, a nice bow on on what we've been talking about. You know, we've we started out with your background. We talked about you know just how to. We talked about just moving, collecting data, executing, knowing how to pivot, knowing how to make decisions, going through our thought life and making sure we're doing that. How to how to lead with influence. How to handle our teams. Talked about productivity. We talked about innovation. I think I think we packed it all in, Gail. There's a lot. There was a lot. I appreciate you letting me go off on a couple of tangents. I appreciate that. No, it's fantastic. I love it. And, I'm, and I, I love that you rolled with it and kind of gave me some too. It's like, you know, but it just, you know, a couple of things I just want to remind people that are listening is like, make sure you're, make sure you're labeling your thought life, you know, um, recognize, I mean, that this is what I'm taking away, Kale, and I'm very grateful and thank you for the gift, you know, recognizing those negative thoughts and labeling for what they are. And then also really understanding and, and making sure that you're looking at, uh, what you do is not only the reward, but it's also the sacrifice. And that's what's going to move you into that higher performance mode and, and that stage. So that's cool, man. I love it. Awesome. So cool. All right. Well, listen, everybody, thanks for listening in today. CEO for life podcast. We'll take you, we'll meet you on the next episode, but again, Kale, thanks for everything. And, and now how best people to reach you LinkedIn, probably if they want to connect with you a little bit further. It's funny. I'm actually on, I'm on LinkedIn, but I'm on there less, but definitely you can find me on LinkedIn. Kale Owen, you can find me. I'm more active on Instagram and TikTok. So okay. at Kale Owen, sure. and then on both of those platforms, we also, if you want to learn, if you're a gym owner or someone in the fitness industry and you just want a bunch of free content, we have a YouTube channel at gym launch. Uh, you go to our gym launch YouTube channel yeah. and um, we've got a bunch of videos on there to help you learn how to sell and reach more people, change more lives and stack more cash. Yeah, for sure, man. Love the work that you guys do. I mean, it's it's very giving and it's very serving. And uh, you guys have definitely dialed that in, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, the giving will always end up 
getting back more, right? And if you go with that, and I, and I love that about well, at least what I'm seeing from your company, what you guys do, and I, I'm sure it's in your DNA. So thanks for all you do. And we'll see you on the next episode of the CEO for Life podcast. Awesome. Thanks for having me on.